What's up, everybody? It's Big John. And um, this is a sort of a cool video because we have in front of you two high-grade CGC and a CBCS slab. We have a giant size X-Men number one in a 9.4 grade. And right next to that, his brother Mark is holding up an undergraded 9.2 CGC. I have actually looked at that book. That is at least a 9.6 if it's pressed because the problem with the book is it has some indentations from the top of Wolverine's head to the top edge of the book and they're all pressable. So um, I'm going to talk him into resubmitting that to CGC. But what I'm hoping for is that when he receives it back, that it says from the collection of Kevin and Mark Robinette, and they have their own pedigree. Because in my opinion, and you guys already know that I'm very opinionated, and I am an egomaniac, but I'm so pretty, I don't really care what you think, that these gentlemen deserve our admiration, and respect. So I'm gonna turn this over to them and I'm gonna let them tell you how they acquired these books, what made them decide to have them graded or did they buy them that way? And I'm gonna let you guys decide because I'm gonna go wipe my face and blow my nose because um, that's how much respect and admiration. And I just met these gentlemen three days ago but that's how much love I have for them because of the love that they have for this hobby. Well, thanks for that really kind introduction, John. I must say, it fascinates me that you have so much respect for the, the hobby and all we did was just enjoy collecting the comics because we loved them. It was just something that we wanted to read. We enjoyed the artists, we enjoyed the stories. It became a big part of our life and I'm really happy to see that other people take it so seriously as we did when we were young. And so many people just didn't. We were thought to be nerds in high school. And it's just nice to see that there's so much respect for the industry. And that's the one lesson that I'm hoping that people take from this. I hope. And I really do want to see mothers and fathers with their children in your local LCS and the children picking a book and reading that book and saying, dad, I want to go next month or in two weeks and I want the next issue because I love that issue. And they don't care what it's worth because they're eight, nine, 10 years old and they just love the artwork. They love the stories. And they fell in love with that, like these two gentlemen did. And that's what I hope that you guys see. The point of them, me having them hold those books up, is I hope that the first thing in your mind wasn't the monetary value of these books, because they are quite substantial. Also, you're looking at the number one most sought after Bronze Age book in the world. In Incredible Hulk 181 and then right next to it is the second most sought-after Bronze Age book and that is giant size X-Men number one do not see the monetary value because that's what they didn't see they bought the book because they fell in love with the story with the artist and the reason why Mark has the 181 is because Kevin got pissed off because they changed artists in the Incredible Hulk and he stopped buying Incredible Hulk. That's why Kevin does not own a copy of 181 and his brother does. But Mark doesn't have a giant size X-Men. Number one. I don't know why. I haven't talked to him about that. I'll pick his ear brain on that later. But I'm going to let these guys take over. And I want them to tell you how they acquired these books. These monster Bronze Age collectibles that lead the industry. 
and that people would basically borrow rod steel to try to acquire these holy grails of the Bronze Age. Mark, you're up first, brother. Well, very well. Nothing exciting about this one. I bought it off of the newsstand. I bought it off of the rack. I paid 25 cents for it. He robbed them! <laughs> That's what they wanted, 25 cents. That's well, you could have argued with them, dang. <laughs> I, just, I just bought it off the rack, read it, put it in a board in the bag, stuck it into the collection. Put and it, how long? Put it away. How long, Mark, has that book been in your PC? Well, since 1974 when I bought it. So 1974, Mark walks into what was? I'm not even sure. A yeah. drugstore, maybe, probably something like that. So, yeah. yeah, probably a drugstore. So he walked in, he slammed his quarter down on the counter because he couldn't get it out of his pocket quick enough, and he bought that book, and it has been in his PC since 1974. Beautiful white pages on that book. Yes. It's an absolutely beautiful copy of that book. And if he would have pressed it, if he'd have known someone like me, before he sent it off, that book could possibly have been a 9.6. I don't know if it would reach the 9.8 status, but it would definitely be a 9.6 Incredible Hulk 181. I'm not sure I knew anything about pressing before I sent this off. It, I think that, how long has pressing been going on? Um, as a legitimate business? Yeah. Um, I've been doing it now for 20 years, legitimately. Really? I, I had not heard of But it. I'm not sure of the grading companies, um, how long they might have been yeah. doing it. Yeah, I'd, I'd not heard of it, but I, I bought this issue just because it was the next issue of the Hulk. I liked the Hulk. Reading, and you like this, you like Herb it. Trimpey. Because that's who did the book, right? you know, the artist. I didn't, I didn't dislike him, I just uh, enjoyed the story. And this was the next issue, so I bought it. And Kevin? Tell everybody why you don't own a copy of 181. Well, I I had been putting on. Uh, uh, I'd gone to art school, and I and I had met. Um, I'd gone to a convention in New York, and I met Marie Severin, and I was getting her autograph, and she she looked at me and said, uh, and saw that I was from Colorado on my thing, and she says, my brother just moved there, and I says, John. She goes, well, yeah, how far are you from Denver? I said, well, we're just a couple of feet, you know, from Denver. <laughs> I could throw my brother over there. <laughs> yeah, she, she says, well, here's his phone number. You give him a call. He, he'd like to talk to you. <laughs> and so I could just hardly wait to get home. I was just going crazy. Pooping kittens, weren't you? Oh, my gosh, to be able to talk to John Severn, yeah. you know, who had been reading all the Westerns and, and all the, the war books for years. And I called him up, and uh, and he says, where'd you get my number? I said, well, your sister gave it to me. She what? <laughs> you know, and it turned out that he hated fans. He wouldn't go to conventions. He wouldn't do any of that. So what Kevin's not <laughs> telling you is he's a super stalker. <laughs> this was his, his sister's idea of a prank. <laughs> oh, she, and he says, I'll get even with her. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and <laughs> so she was, he, was, he was all upset, and so I... That summer, our school um, was didn't ha had some open classes, and so I went to the school teacher and I said, "Can you, can we get John Severn to come in and teach a class?" And uh, our our schoolmaster in charge of the school had um, studied under Bridgman, and of course Bridgman's one of the iconic uh, illustrators of of anatomy. And he was a big fan of comics and Prince Valiant and, and all Milton Caniff and everybody over the years. He, he was a big comics fan, but we never had a comic class. So he, I got him in contact with Severin and he, he actually talked Severin into coming down and teaching a class. So there was about 10 or 12 of us that took a class under John Severin at the school on how to draw comics. But to be honest, we just sat around and told stories about comic books. <laughs> you know, we hardly drew anything. <laughs> Which is one of your favorite subjects anyway. Oh, it doesn't it really was, matter. It was the greatest time there was to sit around and just talk to and hear the stories. And, 
And of course, he had this story that said he started Mad Magazine. And we just looked at each other and went, oh, that's crazy. You know, but when we went and looked it up, he drew nine of the first ten Mad Magazine comic books. So he was in the, in the first issues. So he was the beginning of Mad. And then he went on to produce Crack and draw for Crack and stuff. And so he, he became a pretty good friend. And, and uh, one thing that he needed was references for Crack. And a friend of ours worked in the movie business so we could get stills from the movies that he would just throw away and I'd, we would rescue them and give them to him. And he'd use them for reference to draw the latest satire for Crack Magazine. And so we became pretty good friends with him. And he, he said that when we started to have our comic conventions that he'd come to my comic conventions. And then he was, he had, he'd go, well, okay, who do you want? I said, what do you mean? He says, who do you want to come to the next one? He says, I'll get you Joe Kubert. I'll get you uh, Carmine Vidal. Who, who do you ever you want? We'll, we'll have him get out here. So he became a great uh, resource to bring in people for my conventions. And it was, it was amazing, you know. And so I got to go over to his house and, and meet with him and the family and so forth. And well, because he, he left Incredible Hulk. Yeah, but you, you because he, he wasn't drawing the Hulk anymore, I, I had other places to spend my money. Okay. You know, I was, I was an art student, yeah. you know. It's, so he doesn't own 181 because his friend did no longer drew Hulk, and so he stopped buying Incredible Hulk, so he didn't get a 181. But instead, he gets the second best Bronze Age book. You know, what can you do? And that is the giant size of X-Men number one that you see in front of you, CBS 9.4, CBCS 9.4. Tell everybody how you acquired that monster. Actually, this uh, friend that went to school, he had bought a stack of them, and he brought it to me, and I was looking at him, and I said, that's, that's the most perfect book I think I'd ever seen. Now, wait a minute. Now, see, I, you didn't tell me that. No, I didn't tell you about this. No, see, <laughs> you're, you're pissing in my pool. Yeah, well, I... Because you just said you bought a... He brought in a stack. He did. He had he had four or five... Don't, don't show people that, man. There's not <laughs> enough newspaper to collect all them kittens. What the hell's wrong with you? I, you know, and I and I said I hadn't seen that yet, and I, and I, I, I think I bought one from him for, oh, I think it was a dollar. Or a dollar. Okay, so now we just pooped some yeah. more. Thank you, uh, Kevin. <laughs> Appreciate but, it. But it had the most crisp edge, and it went right down perfect. And I, like I said, I'd never seen a square bound book that was perfect like that. Yeah, they're usually got some wrinkling or crushing yeah, something. Yeah, or bend or the staple coming through on the back. Yeah, or, something. Or, there was always something inherently wrong with them back in those days. Oh yeah, I mean, my guys, you pull them off the rack. And they were, gonna, they were twisted and bent and everything else. That was what else. we had. It was all we could get was what was on the rack. Yeah. So I talked him out of one of them and, he, and the guy let me let me get it. And, and uh, it was kind of exciting. To, then I put it away and I never even read this one. I just put it away because I just never seen a book that crisp. But. He's never read Giant Size X Men number well, one, have, but. <laughs> but he has a <laughs> nice point. Not, not, this, not, not this that one. one. This one's never been read. That one's never been read. So hence the nine point four grading. Even though um, it's, it's never been pressed, and the only thing that's wrong with that book is on the back, really, and it's pressable defects. So um, we might have to, you know, beat Kevin up and take it and press it and resubmit it and give it back to him in a 9.6 or a 9.8. And I think then I could actually get Kevin to poop kittens. <laughs> it would be pretty amazing. They did say there was some little dings in the back. In the back, which yeah. I've already looked at those little dings and they are quite pressable. But for Big John, Kevin, and Mark, we're going to stop it right there. Um, I want... Mark, to show this beautiful book again, because the colors on this are absolutely stunning. And now you get to look at the two most iconic Bronze Age collectibles in comic books, even to this day. So for Big John, that would be me, my friend Mark, and his brother Kevin. We're going to stop it right there. Happy and, collecting. Yes, there you go. Any last words, Kevin? Thank you much, and do, do keep reading comics. There you go, guys. We love you. And as for Big John, as usual, I'm out.